This is the Koros Dura GPS bike computer, taking the software of Koros's watches and simply stuffing it into a bike computer format. There's some super interesting features in here, but ultimately this video is not title review for a reason. To quote famed tech reviewer MKBHD, this device in its current state is barely reviewable. So much so that a review right now would be the same death sentence to this device as it was to the Rabbit R1 or the Humane AI pin. In fact, as a result of reviewer pushback on all the problems with this device, Koros has pushed back the so-called review embargo, if you will, to some point in the future. Though they are still launching this device today, but nonetheless, I'm going to show you what the device is today. Kind of a first look, a hands-on look of things, because let me be clear, this device actually has a lot of potential. Not today, but down the road, this device will absolutely cause heartache for companies like Wahoo, Hammerhead, and Garmin. Uh, how they get there, though, is probably the bigger question. So I'm gonna dive first into the specs really quickly, then I'm gonna do hands-on with this device, just kind of walk you through how it all works, then I'm gonna talk of the issues that I've had, and then finally some final, well, thoughts. First up, the tech specs. Uh, this unit has a 2.7 inch MIP based uh, touchscreen. So that means that essentially, this is the same type of display they have on their watch, or so-called memory and pixel displays. It's different than the LCD displays that you tend to see in other units from Wahoo and Garmin, etc. There are pros and cons to that we'll get into in just a moment. Uh, it's got on the back here, a quarter turn mount that is Garmin compatible. That's a nice touch because that makes it completely compatible with all the existing mounts out there. Uh, it also has on the side a digital crown for navigation, pros and cons to that we'll get to in just a second, as well as one button there, and again, the touchscreen that I mentioned earlier on. The weight for this thing is 97 grams. It does include an extra out front mount as well. That's an additional weight of roughly, I think, 47 or so grams. That out front mount even has a little screw on the bottom so you can permanently leave this thing attached to your bike. That's how confident they are in the battery life claims that they've got for this unit, which is unquestionably its standout feature that we'll get to in just a second. As like most of the bike computers today, it has dual frequency and multi-band GPS. It also has Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth, Wi-Fi primarily being for downloading maps. It's got temperature sensors, barometric altimeter, a gyroscope, it's an accelerometer, it's got all that good stuff there. Things like the accelerometer is used for the bike alarm function, so you can have this on your bike, and if your bike shakes, then it makes a horrifically loud sound. Kudos to Koros, by the way, for instituting the loudest beeper known to mankind this device. Uh, they heard some of the other beepers, like the Caruse 3 really loud beeper, and they said, hold my beer all of the beer. Uh, it is mind-bogglingly loud, but again, things for the review later on down the road. In theory, it has crash detection and group ride and safety alerts, but none of those are, are really working today. It's got structured workouts and training plans, all things from the same Koros watch family. Uh, all the stuff on the Koros watch is on this. So if you're asking yourself, is that feature from the Koros watch on this? The answer is yes, it's the same software. Uh, however, there are some features the Koros watches don't have anymore, like AMP Plus support, that is on this. That allows the connectivity sensors like power meters and cycling sensors and heart rate straps that are both AMP Plus as well as Bluetooth Smart, including things like Radar and Shimano Di2 and shifting and stuff like that. And of course, it's got integration with third-party apps like Training Peaks and Komoot and Strava. All the same integrations that it's had on the watch side are here as well for all the same reasons. For example, Strava and Komoot, you can push your routes to it, as well as Training Peaks, you can push structured workouts to it, etc. But unquestionably, its standout feature, the thing it's hanging its virtual hat on, is the claimed battery life. And claimed is the most important word here. Now, there are two different battery claims on this device. The first is a mind-boggling 120 hours of GPS battery life in its base GPS mode. The second one is multi-band or dual frequency mode, which they're saying 70 hours of claimed battery life. But neither of those take account of the solar panel, which is this entire top section right there underneath Dura and down to about there. So it's kind of hard to see exactly depending on the, the angle of the light. Uh, but in that case, this big solar panel can get a two to one ratio. And it's the, or one to two, however you want to phrase it, it's one rail riding gets you two hours of battery gain, which is massive compared to what Garmin does. Garmin is like, 15%, 20% in best of solar gain. So you ride an hour and you might get like three to five minutes back in a really sunny sort of day. Uh, here, that is twice your riding time. And again, that goes back to Chorus's idea of forever power with this device. That's why they have the screw in the mount is not for like UCI regulation stuff like Wahoo has. This is because they believe you can leave it on your bike forever and never actually have to take it off to charge it. Again, 
that's the theory, not necessarily the reality today. Which then gets us to the final item of note here, which is the price. 249 US dollars are all the currencies I'm showing right about there. Uh, very, very impressive. If they can deliver all the features they're claiming, uh, that puts them a bit below Wahoo's Bolt. Wahoo's Bolt is officially, I think, $299, but practically speaking, it's often on sale for like $249. So I would just consider the kind of the wash of a territory there between $250 and $300. Bucks. So with that, let's just simply go straight into it, kind of walking through some features. I've got a big list of features I want to walk through here. Uh, but first off, this is the unit itself. You're going to interact with this digital crown right there, and you can see these are the modes it has. Road, indoor, gravel, mountain bike, e-bike, and e-mountain bike. Uh, and then also, as I mentioned earlier on, it has that touch screen for getting through stuff here. Uh, if you tap into system, you can pair accessories, Wi-Fi, the bike alarm, more settings. You can switch, of course, between uh, metric and uh, statue on the US side. You can change your DPS frequency side from dual frequency uh, to auto. Auto switch back and forth smartly. They haven't defined the battery times for auto, just for all systems and dual frequency. Again, 120 and 70 hours. Uh, switching back here, you've got sensors into settings. So when it comes to sensors, you can pair AMP Plus and Bluetooth smart sensors. It has, in theory, all the biggies, right? So for example, power meters and heart rate straps and uh, cadence sensors and speed sensors and DI2 and SRAM access or e-tapper, basically the AMP Plus shifting profile uh, and varier radar and all these things, right? In practice, they don't all work that well. Most of the Bluetooth sensors they have do work because they're familiar with those profiles, but most of the AMP Plus sensors they have don't work. So if you have an AMP Plus power meter, for example, the data is all super wonky. It has so-called sticky watts, so like it'll say one value and then repeat it three or four times, makes the power data useless. Uh, Very radar has disconnects. In the case of Shimano DI2, it's missing some of the data streams. In the case of SRAM ETAP, it's missing uh, some of the button customization. So there's a lot of work to be done in those areas that just simply is like early beta quality right now. Again, at best in its current incarnation. Anyways, let's just load up a ride like we're gonna go for a ride here. Uh, I'm gonna tap a road right there. And then I have basically, you'll see boom right there. I've got my GPS. I could start, I could add a route to it. Uh, I could add a structure workout. I could add alerts, for example, speed, date, and all the, all the alerts you see right there. You can read, right? So you can see all those alerts right there. Uh, accessories is where I would have different accessories. Again, AMP Plus, et cetera, paired. Uh, split screen. Split screen is actually pretty cool. I'm gonna enable that for right now. Let's just show you how this works. And then we're gonna go back up to the top and we'll just start this without a route. I'll show you routing in just a quick second. So we'll hit start, there we go. And I'm not sure why it's upset about the app. The app's here, it's on, who knows. Anyways, this is split screen. So on the top of split screen, you have your map page right there. And then down below, as you iterate through, it's all your data pages are condensed down into essentially those two line items there with a timer at the bottom. Uh, you can zoom out on the map by pressing that, uh, and it takes a couple seconds. There we go, zoom out again, and so on. You can always turn off a split screen though if you want to by holding this right there and going to activity settings, and then going down into split screen and turning this off. And this gets you the bigger data pages that you kind of know and love, right? These are all the things you can customize. There's your map right there, swiping again. Uh, and you can swipe, by the way, there you go, like that, and iterate through these as you see fit. I don't know why it says assist level because I'm not in the e-bike mode, I'm in the road mode as far as I know. So again, lots of little quirky things right there that just, you see, and this is just like a, the one I just discovered right now, there was a boatload more of quirky things that are simply not ready at this point in time. Now, while the split screen is really cool, the thing is I want the split screen for the map, but not the rest of the data pages. And those are the kind of things that are actually easy for Coros to add over time. They just need simply the time to do it. But again, it's one more item on the list of things that's ever growing for the dev team to add or fix or whatever the case may be. Uh, now, I wanna stop this for a second. I wanna show you how the navigation, how it works. So I'm gonna finish this, Oops, go back there, uh, finish this finish this. And here's the problem with the digital crown. Um, I'm going to say up front, as a personal preference, I think digital crowns suck across the board. They suck on the Apple Watch. They suck on everything across the board uh, from a watch standpoint. The only scenario they're great for is zooming on a map. That's super useful. The problem with digital crowns on this device, as I found out both gravel riding and mountain biking, is you can't get it without it being like flaky and goes to the wrong spot. Uh, so right now, even here, it's finicky trying to get it on this table. Like this is like the perfect scenario, but when you're not riding and you're bumping along like this and you cannot get it because you're trying to get it and it's going everywhere, Look, uh, I appreciate innovation. Just give me buttons. Every sports person ever, give me buttons. Uh, and right now there's only one button and it's, it's not awesome. So in any case, I'm gonna go ahead and finish this right now. There we go. We'll back out of this real quick. Uploading, we'll talk about that later on. I can't get out of the uploading menu because it has to finish uploading first. Again, like I know these are little things. And I, I know it sounds like I'm getting frustrated, but 
I don't feel like, I feel like Coros rushed the release on this to hit a magical date in June, so they have it for the summer, as opposed to taking the time to absolutely nail this and kill this. To be really clear, Coros is going to absolutely kill it. They're gonna crush this. Not now, not this fall, next spring or so, they're gonna get there. Can I back out now? Yay, there we go. Okay, road, not e-bike by the way. Uh, down to navigation, there we go. Oh, I'm just gonna load up a Stelvio. I wanna kinda show something here. Uh, so we tap a Stelvio, and then we hit start route, route details, or climb. And right here, I wanna show you climb. They have climb pro of sorts. Now this Stelvio route, as you can see from the screenshot right there, is literally from the base of the Stelvio to the top of the Stelvio. It's straight up. I've done this route. You've probably done this route. If you live in Europe at some point, you might have done it anyways. Uh, and there's no flat sections here. It is straight up. It's subdivided this into three different segments. That's not the whole point of like climb pro type thing. The whole point is tell you how much suck is left to the top, not how many pieces left to a random point along the way. And this was the same as well on my rides in Colorado last weekend. We had some big climbs, not quite this big, but like half this, about a thousand meters or so. And it was seven different segments for that particular climb. Again, it's these little details that I don't think they really understand how they're implementing them. And anyways, when you're out and routing, here's how this all works. Uh, you're gonna see breadcrumb style routing like you can see on this B-roll on the screen right here and it's gonna show your upcoming turns. If you're lucky, the arrow will be the same direction as your turn. I'm, I'm not kidding, by the way, here. Uh, half the time, the arrow was the wrong direction of the turn. Uh, about a third of the time, it told me to turn around, and the remainder of the time, it told me to go the correct direction of the turn. Uh, if you miss the turn, nothing's going to happen. Not for another 500 to 800 meters, at which point, it'll go ahead and tell you you've missed the turn half a mile after you've missed the turn. And if you have connectivity to the internet at large, it'll offer you two options for rerouting that you have to manually take. The first option is to go ahead and reroute and join the route. The second option is to go to the destination, basically your endpoint of that particular route. It doesn't do this automatically like all other bike computers. You have to take action for it to do that after again, that roughly half a mile. And by the way, that only works if your phone is with you and you have internet connectivity because there is no rerouting on the device itself. Coros believes that this device can do that better with the internet connected. And that's certainly true if you're like in New York City. But where you ride a lot of times, including half my rides this past week, were in places with no cellular connectivity. And in those cases, it simply doesn't work. It simply just draws a straight line to wherever you're supposed to be, and that's it. And that's not really acceptable for a bike computer in 2024. Now, the rest of the data pages that you can see as I'm scrolling through this, that works fine. Like the data pages show up, they're fine, et cetera. Yeah, the power data is totally wrong, but hey, the data pages are there like, any other bike computer from the last decade or so that cost half as much. At the end of the ride, you're gonna see a summary about that particular ride, including things like your uh, times and effort and training load and all that fun stuff, as well as your solar battery gains. Again, right now though, I don't really know what those are. Like they say what they are there, but they're not truthful at all because each time I go out for a ride, I'm losing like three to 6% an hour, which puts me at roughly like 24-ish hours, 25 hours, somewhere in that range anyways, not the 70 to 120 hours. And this is in bright sunny conditions where I should be theoretically gaining time each time I've ridden. So again, that whole piece there, Cora says they're working on, it'll come at some point, but I, don't, I won't believe that till I see it in terms of like, literally screwing onto the bike, leaving it there, and not having the battery life ever go down on sunny rides. Now there is one kind of neat feature at the end here that's hard to show because it happens really quickly, but Chorus, if you have the app open on your phone, is constantly streaming a copy of that file to your phone to the app. So when you press end or save at the very, very end, it only takes a couple seconds for that save to complete and push to the app, as opposed to some other units take like 15 or 20 seconds or so, or something like that, to complete and save and push it to the app. Uh, I mean, that is cool. Like I'm not gonna disagree with that. I would argue though that focus on the important things first, then do the cool features, right? All the important things are still broken. You got to do the cool features later on once you've got the other stuff sort of sorted out. So that's a good time then to quickly go through the issues that I'm having. I've talked a lot about them. I just want to summarize them in like 30 seconds. I'll try to summarize in 30 seconds. Uh, number one, the battery gains aren't real as I've talked about. Number two, anything and everything to do with the routing is just simply wrong. Like visually, physically wrong. It tells me to go left, I should go right, and, and all this stuff. A lot of that is bad interpretation of the files from Strava and Knut, et cetera. That's routing engine stuff. That's the hard work of having a GPS bike computer. Uh, rerouting is even worse. If all that previous stuff on routing was wrong, anything to do with rerouting is 
um, it's totally useless. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, data issues with power meters. Again, like I said earlier on, the data is just wrong. It's just bad recording of data from AMP Plus side. I haven't tried Bluetooth power meters because again, AMP Plus is generally used because there's more data on the power meter side than AMP Plus. The Climb-ish feature, Climb Pro-ish wannabe feature, whatever they want to call it at the end is simply useless right now because it subdivides into an unknown number of, of climbs for one continuous climb. So that's not super useful. Uh, and then ultimately there's just a whole crap ton of other little wonky things that aren't working today. Uh, for example, when I push a Strava route to this device, I have to wait three minutes till I can get it to the device. Just to be clear, I create the route on Strava, it syncs instantly to anything out there, and then I have to wait three minutes for the app to see it. Once I wait that 180 seconds for the app to see it, then I can manually push it to the device. Every other bike computer today, you create it on Strava, you press sync on your device, or even don't press sync in the case of Hammerhead, and boom, it instantly shows up in a couple seconds, especially via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth Smart. And these are the things that Coros really needs to look at their competitors out there and understand that some of the things they do on the watch side, while amazing, aren't going to cut it on the bike computer side. Uh, and that's the thing here, is that I've been following Coros a long time, longer than probably every other reviewer in this space. I first covered them when they had their helmet, like almost a decade ago now, I think. Super cool helmet they had. They actually started in the cycling space, by the way, in case you didn't know that. Uh, then I was the first one to cover them on the Coros Pace One Watch, the very first time I saw it in a trade show in the corner of like an inner bike, or maybe it was a CES booth somewhere, and they're like, check this little thing out, right? And that was the start of Coros as the watch company that you know them today. And that Coros watch company has absolutely made huge inroads into the market. They've unquestionably taken a massive amount of market share from Sunto and Polar, and they've been a solid pain in the butt for Garmin as well. And a big reason of how they've done that is Coros has a massive update cycle. They push out new updates roughly every quarter, sometimes more, and those updates are all the features their community asks for. They're very, very good at that. Arguably better than Garmin was at for a number of years. I think Garmin's kind of caught up into that whole thing as well, but certainly better than Wahoo is. And again, it's that drive that Coros has that will unquestionably eventually make this thing very successful and make it a solid pain in the butt for Wahoo and Garmin and Hammerhead and every other bike computer out there today. The problem is that right now, if we set aside all of the bugs, which is a huge amount of bugs, this computer is right now no different than a Wahoo Bolt from five to seven years ago. And even that is being generous. So Coros has to fix all those issues first. Then at that point, they're at the starting point of Wahoo Bolt from five to seven years ago. And now that is not a bad thing to be. The Wahoo both from five to seven years ago was still a great unit. And there are advantages here if you're a Coros watch user, because at this point you've got that entire like ecosystem thing going on there. But again, there's a lot of catch up that has to be done. Some of the stuff will be relatively easy for them to fix. Things like the Climb Pro wannabe thing and segmenting that, a bunch of different segments, they'll sort that out pretty quickly. And a lot of the other little things they'll figure out relatively quickly. But stuff like routing, even if they change direction from cloud-based routing to on-device-based routing, that is a huge shift. That's a shift that Wahoo and Hammerhead uh, and other companies in this space took like two to three years to get to reliability level that you could actually use cycling. Yeah, they might throw it out in a few months or six months or eight months, but to get it to the point where you actually trust it, again, for Wahoo and Hammerhead was two to three years. Look at Apple when they introduced Apple Maps back a few years ago, a number of years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was now. You all remember that, right? You remember all the jokes that were made, how bad it was? Like, I still remember that. How many years did it take Apple to get to the point with all of their resources that you could trust Apple Maps? It was a few years. It's not gonna be any different chorus. The world is an incredibly complex thing to route across, especially from a bike computer standpoint that can go on-road as well as off-road. So I would encourage Coros to be realistic with some of their timelines. At the same time, I would encourage their competitors to understand that once Coros figures this stuff out, that's gonna hurt because Coros will get there. They always tend to get there. It just takes a little bit of time. With that, stay tuned for a review at some point. Coros says they're gonna release this thing on July 15th. It probably won't be appreciably different by then. I would say this thing should have been released at best in the fall, and realistically, is probably in a somewhat baseline state by next spring. Again, knowing what I know from doing this for a decade or so and following Coros as well, and how fast they can iterate, I think next spring is a good time to look at this and be like, that could be interesting. That could be uh, market changing. With that, thanks for watching.